In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A friend of mine says, it takes God to know God. We can get a certain distance towards the divine on our own, but eventually we need supernatural help. It takes God to know God. If that's true, and I think it is, knowing God requires a bit more than the techniques we use to learn things in most of our life. If we need to familiarize ourselves with something ordinarily, we might read about it, talk to someone who's an expert in it, Google it. And of course, people read and talk and Google Christianity as they should. The world is full, uh, for example, of skeptics who researched the historical data on the resurrection and came to think it was plausible. There are enough books of individuals telling that story to fill a whole bookshelf. And in the Episcopal Church, at our best, we place a high value on that kind of thing. Intellectual inquiry, encouraging asking questions, hoping people will think things through and not just blindly accept what someone else says. And at our best, this is a good trait. Sometimes among our denominational family, though, it turns into condescension toward others, or it turns into intellectual laziness that applauds questioning as an end in itself and resists actually reading and thinking historically and textually about doctrine and scripture. I've noticed in discussions of the Bible that as our culture has shifted steadily to emphasize self-expression as the highest good, folks seem increasingly to want to jump straight to how they feel about a text or how they feel about other people's actions related to the general theme of the text rather than beginning by using our brains to read and absorb and interact with what the text actually says. The gospel we have this morning is like that. We lose so much if we jump straight to how it makes us feel without noting that it's really full of perplexing details. It says, Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, peace be with you. Excuse me, how did he get in the room? They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. But wait a minute, you just told us in the previous verse that not five minutes ago, they were all discussing the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead. What's with the ghost idea? And startled, I can understand, but if they know it's Jesus, why are they terrified? And then our Lord says, look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Why does he tell them to touch him when he told Mary Magdalene not to? to touch him? Is he proving his identity by showing them the marks of crucifixion? And if so, why are they still there? Why are there wounds in a risen body? Does resurrection not fix that? It goes on, they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. So, do risen bodies have to eat? How often? And is this just some kind of stunt? If we don't consider the text closely enough to feel disturbed by it and ask questions about it, we're never going to receive its benefits. We have to start by observing what the text actually says. And then, then Jesus tells them, that he told them, he says, I told you while I was still with you, everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms 
must be fulfilled. And here comes the moment where as important as data and observation are for Christians, as important as they are, we go beyond them as we're confronted with this startling sentence, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now don't jump over that, look at what it says. Note that this is not a claim that the disciples thought harder, or that the disciples changed their opinion, or that the disciples heard some new information from Jesus. It's a claim that there was an act of God at that moment. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now that starts with their already being aware of what's in the scriptures. You can't understand something you're not even aware of. But it goes beyond that. Because at this moment, Jesus supernaturally changes the way they are able to absorb and comprehend something that they had already naturally observed and learned. It takes God to know God. Some of us have been in good Bible studies, ones where people both intellectually observe the text and are open to the Holy Spirit, as opposed to one where people just share how they already feel about things loosely related to the theme of the passage. And if you've been in a good Bible study, I will wager that you have had this happen to you. You have had God open your mind to understand the scriptures. You saw things one way and then something happened inside you that you weren't the cause of and everything looked different. It takes God to know God. So in the spiritual life, it's definitely not that we don't use our intellect, that we don't use our powers of research, it's that we do, absolutely. But then God adds something to them that we could never achieve on our own. He reveals himself. When we carefully consider what the scriptures actually say, then God steps in with the next step. He opens our minds in the words of today's gospel to understand or in, in the words of the collect prayer for today. He opens our eyes to behold him at work. So God gave us intellect so that we could use them. But God also acts upon us and reveals himself to bring us closer to him than mere human powers can get. Both these things are true. And in the Christian life, neither one can stand alone.